My name is Kobe Kennedy, and we are in Bushwick, home of failed artists and trust fund children. About to um, chop up a street sign. This is, if you will, the new Lata Avenue sign, the Susan of Machete. All right. This is my favorite part of the day. I went through a lot of iterations on how to actually make these, and I decided I gotta make them, you know, the way that they're actually gonna be made. The way that they're supposed to be made in the narrative. Ripped down off the street, fucking taken to like a makeshift shop and just hacked the f up. They started making them essentially just good enough to kill them. Everything shows up on film, and more importantly, everything shows up in a gallery. The whole purpose of these is to do extreme amounts of bodily harm. So, you know, you gotta make them. The more real you make them, the less problems you run into later. Truthfully, if you come down hard enough, you can take somebody's arm off. Or at least get like two thirds of the way through. It is good, it's got like good weight to it. The next thing is to take it back to the spot and lace up the handle. The dresses, the sculptural pieces, the machines, everything ties into the core of the entire series, which is a series of film vignettes that play out everything that you see in the paintings and the photos. It revolves around a narrative that takes place in post-apocalyptic Brooklyn. All the sculptures are elements in the film itself. The street signs are exactly that. They're almost acts of desperations in themselves. Pieces of 20th century leftovers that are repurposed and reused for people's momentary needs. The machetes, they're made like cottage industry style. They just take stuff from wherever they can find them to make them. I'm like, where, where do I get grip material? I'm like, I don't know, I got this crap laying around. Something that'll keep you from getting sliced up while you're slicing other people. Like pure utilitarianism. Does it really say I've, I've beheaded a son of a bitch? Or does it say I picked this up at Macy's? Gotta treat him like yo. That's broken in. That's what we call a proper Brooklyn machete. Museums are plenty we've got in the city. More galleries than you can shake a paintbrush at. But what you may not always be aware of is how much public art we have in our streets and on our walls. And why is it public artists choose to create their work there? To answer that question and a lot more, we've invited three people who are all involved in public art in Brooklyn. Patrick Doer is program director of Groundswell, a nonprofit known throughout the city for its murals and for the work it does with community groups. Welcome. Thank you. Very. Glad to have you. And Raki Barlow is the Director of Education and Partnerships at Walk of Arts, which offers tours of all that art that's hiding in plain sight. Welcome. Thanks for having me. And Kobe Kennedy, who we just saw explaining his thing for machetes, is an artist and videographer. Welcome to you. Hi, glad to be here. Yeah. Well, let's start off, guys. I, we, everybody wants to know about those machetes. So you <laughs> have been a working artist uh, for a long time now. And mm. um, what? I, there's so much to tell. But tell us about the machetes. What was the inspiration for that series? Uh, well, the machetes are part of a larger project called In the Service of a Villain that I'm working on. And they're really a response to um, me spending about a decade outside of the country and coming back to America. You know, I missed the whole Bush years. And then uh, I got back and uh, seeing the uh, disparities between um, different economic classes, different social classes, and um, certain pieces of culture disappearing from the American scene. And uh, the machetes themselves are kind of a grassroots reaction to, uh, I guess, uh, defending um, a, a social, uh, social history. Okay, so what sort of statement were you trying to use and why use the street signs as, mm. the, as the material? Well, they're actually part of a narrative, a larger narrative, that um, deals with different issues of entitlement and um, uh, social change. And certain uh, characters, certain archetypes in the narrative, they take the street signs because they're left with, uh, that's all they're left with to fight with. That's their only defense. 
Um, the original idea behind the series was uh, a question of what would future generations, uh, how would they build their culture if the only thing that they had to build off of was the media, uh, that uh, the detritus of culture that we leave behind now. That was really deep. That was deep. <laughs> that was deep. <laughs> well, so so if we take that and then we that that in in some ways is very much in your headspace and internal dialogue that you're having mm. um, about your own work um, mm -hmm. and your own expression and talking about um, that being sort of more internal, although you you obviously display publicly and exhibit publicly, but talking about community and community groups and walking tours, et cetera. Can you talk to us about Groundswell and what you guys are doing with the public space? Sure. So Groundswell is a community mural organization. Been around almost 18 years, uh, coming up on a 500th piece of uh, large scale public art. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, it's amazing. Working, working in communities, uh, uh, underserved and, and um, uh, disenfranchised communities with youth from those communities to address social justice issues. So the, the murals are beautiful, they're lasting legacies to the community, um, but they also definitely target um, relevant issues in the community, in the city, in the world. Um, it's done through a process of two teaching artists working again with youth from the community, often uh, youth that are uh, stigmatized as high risk, uh, to research whatever the given topic is, create a cohesive design, and then do the fabrication. Okay. Now, before you were project manager, you were also a, a teaching artist yourself. Wait a minute now, program yes. director. Program, dire <laughs> program director. Yeah. So can you tell yeah. us a little bit about your experiences um, you know, as a teaching artist and what, you know, what that gave you? Yeah, I mean, I, um, I kind of stumbled on becoming a teaching artist uh, sort of uh, out of compassion and organically. I, I, um, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn. I came from a family that was, you know, struggled to, uh, to make ends meet. Um, I dropped out of high school at, at uh, 16. I got into trouble. I did drugs, sold drugs, did crime. And I think it was art. I know it was art, by the grace of God, that, that saved me from a, the path that I was headed on. And, um, you know, when I, when I became an adult, I realized I wanted to give that back. Um, so I went into uh, teaching uh, art to, again, to communities uh, that were underserved to try to reach kids that were on a similar path that I was on. Um, I think, you know, when I was going through that phase of my life, I was, I was uh, acting out because I lacked the words to express what I was going through, and I found art as a way to express my feelings, and I feel like so many of these kids that uh, that are in a similar situation, that are, that are getting into trouble, that are acting out, are in that same position. They, they have so much to say, but they don't have necessarily the language to say it or the outlet to say it. And art um, gives them that medium to express themselves. Patrick, I think we have a great clip that, that shows some of the kids that you work with, so just exactly what you're speaking about. So maybe we can play that so people can get a sense of what it looks like, the process, et cetera. Absolutely. So. 